Right, welcome back to the podcast, guys. This is actually the second recording we've done here. And the reason being is because there's so much information for me to get out regarding Gymshark and how fun it has been, the whole entire journey. The podcast was three hours long and most people aren't really going to listen to that. So it needs to be a little bit more structured. So we are re-recording it. Um, I've got Dan and Ryan here and they're going to ask me questions so I don't go off on a tangent. Dan was one of the first employees alongside Joe. So um, he can back up some of the stories and um, add his insight too. So yeah, let's get things started. So I think uh, first question needs to be kind of how did you and Ben meet? So we both went to the same school together. We were acquaintances in school, but then we we clicked a lot more when we both did double ICT together and we started doing projects and he knew a lot more about websites than me. I was a little bit more creative in that sense. So like I would always, let's say, copy some of his work and he had another guy that sat next to him and me and Dan would always copy their work and it was pretty funny. And we just clicked from there and then we went to the gym together and, and we just grew our relationship even further. So how did uh, Gymshark get born from that? Was it a project at school or what was it? How did, how did the whole thing come up about? It, no, it wasn't a project at school per se, but we did projects regarding websites and we then thought, okay, well, if we were making websites online, let's, we were obviously into the gym and we thought, if people are selling supplements, they're obviously making money online and we kind of got addicted to how can we make money online? So we thought, okay, if we start selling supplements and we can rank above them on Google, because most people don't, most people will search for a supplement like waste, gold, standard, optimum, nutrition, protein. They'll just search it in Google. It will come up the first time and they'll just click on it and they'll buy it. They won't generally always search the cheapest. And back then we kind of manipulated Google. So we were above everyone else in Google shopping. You can't do that now. Um, we did that through Shopify and collections and stuff. Um, from there, people would buy from us. We would house supplements from other companies on our website and if you ordered from Gymshark supplements it was back then we would then order that straight to you and we would never hold any stock and we were making like two three four pound margin but that's how we got started drop shipping then basically yeah drop shipping supplements so everyone knows us now as clothing but we weren't clothing back then this is in 2011 September 2011 going into 2012 you started selling supplements. How did you transition then into to the clothing? Like what, what sparked that off? So we wanted to sell something called stringer vests. And obviously back then you couldn't get stringer vests from anywhere else but America. So if everyone that's listening remembers Ziz, who was a, an Australian guy who inspired millions of people around the world. And back then he wore this stuff all the time. He wore really small shorts, really fitted clothing and long stringer vests. So you basically went to the gym almost in nothing. <laughs> so you could see all your muscles, everything. You could just pull it down. So it was just a way. It was, it was a gym hack to have your top off in the gym, but obviously you didn't have your top off in the gym and people love that. So we wanted to make this type of clothing, but you couldn't get it. You could only get it from America, as I said. And shipping back then was like $50 for a T-shirt. So you'd pay $25 for a, for a stringer and then you'd have to ship it over and that would be like $75. People weren't paying that. So from there, we thought, okay, let's start making that. We started printing our own vests. We bought the blanks. We got a print. We started printing our own stuff from there and stuck that on the website. And it basically sold a lot quicker than all the supplements. So that was how our transition into the clothing aspect came about. So who started buying this stuff and where, where, was, it, where was the traffic coming from in the early days? So the early days at the very start, I had a, a big following on Facebook back, back then, which was like 50,000 to 200,000 likes and followers. It was on Facebook back then, which is the equivalent to a few million on Instagram now. Um, and we were using those guys at the very start to push traffic to the website. But because it was such a unique niche market, we could sell to people like ourselves that knew they wanted that product that they couldn't get elsewhere. So we kind of focused on a niche, built everything we had around the niche and grew from there, basically. I think people also might want to ask or know why you had like 50,000 or 100,000 followers and likes on Facebook back then, which is equivalent to a lot now. And if I remember correctly, it was because you had a really lean, shredded ad picture, which you can probably fire up on the screen now if you, still, if you still got it. And he had like veins going up his abs. <laughs> And yeah. it, was, it was a really good picture, and I think just loads of people saw it and was like, mad, how do I get this physique? So Lewis used to get contacted by like loads of people from the, you know, who go into the gym working out, like, 
how do I get this? And I think he just grew a following from that. I wasn't big. I was just really lean back then. This is what, when I was 17. So I was just super shredded. I had really good ab structure. And because it was so lean, and I'd, I'd get them pumped and I'd take pictures and they were just shredded. And it was like, what the hell? Like that, that pitch, it looked, the picture completely looked fake. It looked plastic. But yeah, we'll pop it up on the screen. And from there, I, I, I gained quite a lot of followers. So you started selling uh, some supplements and then you started uh, flinging some clothes to your Facebook uh, followers. How did it develop from there then? So obviously we were we were selling also not just to the Facebook guys, we were selling to our, our niche market of bodybuilders that, well, Ziz following, let's say, that wanted the, the stringer vests and, and the small shorts and stuff. Um, but we wanted really fitted clothing and no one else made it at that time. It was a lot of baggy stuff. Back then, uh, things have come on in the last 10 years uh, dramatically in, in terms of clothing in regards to fits. But we thought to ourselves, if we can make ourselves look better in the gym without actually looking better physically, then that's half the battle. And if we knew if we did that, then people would keep going back to the gym. So that was our kind of business plan. Let's make clothing. Let's make tapered bottoms. Let's make tapered tracksuits. Let's make fitted vests. So your shoulders would pop, your legs would pop, it would thin down at the ankle, like that's how the human, human anatomy is. So we kind of copied that Arnold look and put it into clothing and it just, yeah, everyone absolutely loved it. So anything that we loved, that we wanted, that we couldn't get anywhere else, we practically made. So people are really uh, liking the clothing that you're, you're making, you're enjoying wearing it yourself, like and people are buying it from your Facebook pages. Like, What was the, the bigger plan to try and get it out to more people? Uh, well, we, me and Ben never actually thought too far ahead. We were always living in the future, but our plan at that time, because things were moving so fast and the company was growing so rapidly, we were only really thinking six months down the line. So from there, we thought, okay, well, let's go to Body Power 2012 as a visitor, and let's see how it is, because we knew at the time a lot of people were going to these expos, I think it was around 20,000 people were all in one place over a short weekend, which is a lot of people. Um, so we thought to ourselves, okay, well, if we can get our brand in front of these people, then brilliant. So we went to the Body Power 2013, um, 2012 sorry, as a visitor, and we saw slow, clunky brands, and they were sponsoring guys that had only won competitions, and these guys with, that had only won competitions, they weren't very big on social media. They were very small, and obviously they were getting paid probably quite a lot of money. So we thought to ourselves, we watch a lot of YouTube videos. So if we can get all the guys we love to watch on YouTube right now who are getting 40,000, 50,000 views on YouTube and we bring them here, that's more than the whole entire expo is getting the whole weekend and they're getting these daily views. Mm -hmm. So we thought if we can bring these online views to England, to the NEC body power, then our brand would explode. That was our thinking. So we kind of scheduled ourselves for the next year after seeing body power power 2012 so we scheduled body power 2013 in which was an absolute massive step for us i can't remember how much it cost i think it was around eight to ten thousand which was a huge jump considering we were only making small numbers like we we're probably making 500 pound a week maybe so that was that was big numbers for us to just jump into that so um, you just booked it and then just thought you know we're gonna we're gonna work it out in the next 12 months exactly that we thought to ourselves we want to be here. We knew we wanted to be there. We knew we wanted to make a massive impression. We knew we wanted athletes there. Uh, we knew we were going to obviously sell our clothing there. We just hadn't connected all the dots on how we were going to do it yet. We knew we just knew we wanted to be there. So we booked a slot. We put a deposit down for it. And we thought, okay, well, we need, we've got a whole year now to make the money to pay for this stand, <laughs> basically. And it was a big, scary jump for us. Uh, we went by, like, it was like a two-meter stand we went for by maybe 10 meters. So it was long and thin. So it was you could get to it from every angle. It was big front facing and yeah we, we we had a year now to connect all the dots we just chucked ourselves in the deep end and, and here we go so you've just booked uh this stand for next year um you've took that big gamble and you've got 12 months to kind of work it out but what was your plan in them 12 months like how was you going was you just like how was how did that look what was you going to do to kind of get more sales in these next 12 months and where was you even going to like where was you making the t-shirts how was you printing them what was the processes like there tell them about the massive warehouse you had back then <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so obviously back then i know we've kind of skipped ahead but back then me and ben were i was i was working as a pot washer and at burton's menswear so i was a pot washer burton men, burton's menswear had two jobs he was working at pizza hut as a, a pizza delivery driver so in the day 
we would go to uni because we were both at uni at the time. Um, we'd go to uni, we'd print T-shirts on the night, and then when he was at Pizza Hut, I'd be printing T-shirts. When I was at work, he would be um, sewing or printing or packaging, whatever it needs to be. Um, so we were kind of just just absolutely winging it. We had we had all the stock at Ben's. Well, we had all the stock at my house for printing and all the stock for selling at Ben's house. So he would come and pick some T-shirts up for me. He would take them back to his house. And obviously, I'm sure you guys have watched Ben's videos. You've seen our sewing machine that we had. So what he would do with that is we were buying T-shirts from other companies that had labels in. So he would cut that, take out the label, sew a Gymshark label in, basically. That's what we were doing with the sewing machine. And from there, we'd, we'd get orders. We'd hand write every single order that we were getting out onto like a jiffy bag, basically. Package people's orders up, load them into Ben's Ben's car, um, and then with the help sometimes of either Dan or Joe or Ben's dad, Steve, um, we would take them all to the post office. And it was actually quite funny because we were obviously getting quite a lot of orders back then, and we never really had a post office scheduled pickup at our house because we didn't really understand what that was or anything like that. So we would load Ben's car up. We would physically drive to the post office every single day or every three days with 100 orders, let's say, which was a lot of orders in, in, in one big bag. And we'd stand in the post office queue and we would manually ship them all out one by one. But of course, we're stood in the queue for two hours and you've got old Mary's behind us losing her, losing her head, trying to hit us with her walking stick kicking off in the queue. Oh, we had so many arguments with people trying to tell us that we shouldn't be in there. And I'm thinking, well, we're, we're keeping this place afloat. <laughs> so it was actually pretty funny. But the operation was a little bit at the very start of a shit show. We were completely winging it. No business process or anything. It was just an order coming in. Off it goes. Order coming in, print. But what we used to do back then as well, we would have loads of blank T-shirts or blank vests or blank whatever it would be. Get our screen printer and we would print to order. So if you if you ordered, uh, you know, our old fitness logo, if you ordered our, our old bodybuilding logo, that means we could stop them both on our website without holding a lot of stock. So we had a lot of SKUs on our website, which means we could grow faster and we could sell more products to one customer. So it kind of helped us scale a bit faster, but we we were struggling. And that led us on to think, okay, we can't continue this. We need to start make, getting our clothing made abroad. And then once we can get it made abroad, then we can ship it in and we can service all our customers and we can get ready for that growth. Because we knew in the next 12 months, we were going to, if we pulled off what we thought we could pull off, we were going to get crazy amounts of orders and we can't physically print that. It's just not going to work. So this is when we started to look externally in the Middle East, or in Asia, places like that, to look for a clothing manufacturer for Gymshark. How long did it take to do one order back then with the screen print? Oh, man. God. 30 minutes <laughs> per, per order for like a screen printer t-shirt? So uh, no, not probably not per order, but the whole process of the screen printing process was long-winded. It was very messy. You had, If you got ink, if you, because there was so much ink everywhere as well, if you touched a piece of clothing with, with your fingers and you had a bit of ink on it, then that piece of clothing was gone because you couldn't get the ink off. So it was very messy. There was a lot of waste. You'd get... Like, it looks like a picture frame. You'd cover it in this, um, this, I, I'm not sure the term, but this, like, green ink, basically. You'd use this Gymshark, like, tracing paper, right, and then you'd put a light on it, and then you'd wash it off after, and you'd have a stencil, and you'd just pull ink through it onto the onto the actual T-shirt. Then you'd put it under a heat, like, process, and it would cure the ink, so when you washed it, it wouldn't come off. So that's basically what we'd do, and we'd just print a few of them, put it away. So we'd, we'd get the... We'd tr what we tried to do is we'd print five to 20 of each size of each style that we could and stack them up so we didn't have to keep sending it up every day. But obviously that was going so fast, we were sending that out daily, so we knew we had to look outside that realm and start to get clothing in to grow. Okay, so um, was you on track uh, financially and everything ready for body power? Did you have to take any help on... Uh, financially from like parents or loans or anything like that to make sure body power happened? Uh, no. So even from day one starting Gymshark, we kind of just drop shipped and, and built cash up and kept putting cash into the business. Me and Ben never took any money out. We never took any salaries. We never run any of our personal bills through the business. So we just kept keeping the money in the company. We both stayed at home when we went to uni. We both, again, had jobs. Um, so we knew and we were comfortable that the money that was generating from even if we didn't grow 
over the 12 month period, we knew that we could cover the stand cost. So we weren't really too worried about that, but that wasn't our main focus then. Our main focus was how can we get Gymshark to 250,000 to 400,000 to a million pound. That was our main thought in our head because the stand two months after once we booked it was less of a, less of a stress but as body power slowly came around, and that was a big stress because we had so much to think about, so many moving components. And then this is when we started asking for help more from Dan, more from Joe, Ben's brother, and more from Steve, uh, Ben's dad. So when body power came around, was you still hand printing these t-shirts or, was, or did you start buying them abroad? Yeah, so no, in that, in that space of time, we'd worked out a plan. We ended up, Getting T-shirts from abroad, uh, we actually got something called, as everyone knows, the the Gymshark Lux tracksuit, which was a tracksuit that was very fitted. It was unique, and what we wanted to do once we once we got all the athletes on board, we wanted to we knew that we wanted to create a team that was all in matching clothing. So we wanted to create a team. We wanted to, so we wanted to create obviously good clothing, a team, and then Gymshark, and link all those guys together, which was the emotional connection, which is what catapult with Gymshark up from there. So body power's coming around. You've, you kind of know that you want to uh, get some athletes along. How did you pick these? Did they, did you just email them? Did they even like, did they pay you? Did they get back to you? Like, did you have to agree to pay them? Like what does the whole af- getting the athletes interested in Gymshark and willing to agree to come to body power? Um, what, what does that whole process look like? Uh, well, Good question. I mean, at the time, what we were doing is everyone used Facebook. So I would message people on Facebook and they'd reply to me. And I would basically said, like, we got together and we thought, okay, so if we get Lex, we liked Lex, uh, Lex Fitness, Matt Ogus, um, Lovado, it was his like duo at the time, uh, Alan Gabay, Jeff Side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we did ask Johnny Starr, but Johnny Starr couldn't make it. But there wasn't, at the when we found these guys, it was literally just message them on Facebook and let's see what they did. We went from low to high really. So I think we messaged Lex first because he was UK based. Messaged him on Facebook. He replied straight away. We ended up meeting him at his gym locally and then he agreed, like, okay, let's come. Then we got Ogus and Lovado on and then we ended up getting Jeff and then we ended up getting Alan. Alan. But what we did is we kind of used everyone's social media power as a pull to get each other on before if we can get them all there it's going to be hard for us just to get let's say one and then have them enjoy themselves or want to come back next year but if we can get five people that are all big on social media they can all use their different followings to grow then they're all going to agree so we only ended up paying for their flights just to come over from america because back then most americans didn't really and probably still now most americans don't really leave america so bringing them over to the UK was a massive thing for them and they would really want to do that because they're probably not going to have the opportunity or may not to come over. And we thought if we get the guys from America over as well, then all of the UK guys that are never going to go to America to see them are all going to flood to see them at body power. And that concept worked. It's just like, it was like influencer marketing before it had even been called influencer marketing. So it was around with like the bigger brands and celebrities, but like it was really early days. Well, no, no one was getting paid well, yeah. on social media. Instagram was very small. Uh, no, Instagram wasn't there then. Uh, I think it was. I think it. I don't know when it started. It just started at, it, at the it? end of Somewhere. at the end of uni. So yeah. So Instagram right wasn't very there. big. People didn't didn't get paid for posts back then. No one did. So we were able to get people for a very cheap price and have a very very big return on investment. Uh, well. Yeah, pretty much. For 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 like the athletes, you know, this the original Gymshark family where it was being born. For them to get a flight to England to receive free clothing to meet other like minded people, like you know, Matt Ogus might have known about Jeff C, but never had a chance to meet him. So this was all like, you know, a gold mine for them. Like they had to take the opportunity. It was it was amazing for I them. I suppose their their only opportunity really to to come out was to win a big bodybuilding competition or something okay. like that, and then get get sponsorship with like. I don't know, USN or Optimum Nutrition, like a big company like that. So you, I can see why they were so keen to come along as well. And obviously Body Power is in your hometown in Birmingham, which made obviously a lot easier for you getting stuff there. And, and Yeah, it, and that it did, but it was a big struggle. But even then, they probably didn't even consider Body Power. Body Power was probably never even on their radar. They probably never even heard of Body Power at the time because, I mean, there, there was there was big ones in the US like the Arnold and stuff and, 
But they were so different to how they were after we'd been in them for like two, three years because we had changed the way they all worked. Like, it, it was completely different. They were very structured, almost like gyms would just, gym owners would go there just to see if they could speak to the owners of the supplement companies and stuff like that. It wasn't really consumer based at the very start, but we turned it into a consumer based business. And you would just flop there to get loads of free stuff. Like, we kind of, yeah, we forced that. We forced everyone's hands for these expos. So let's rewind a bit and then let's talk about how much, like, was Body Power a success? Like, what what did it look like? What did that very first one look like? As in when you, because you kind of going a little bit ahead there. Yeah, so Body Power's coming around. We're thinking we need to get we need to get the stock in. We're obviously getting the track suits, which I, which I mentioned, uh, getting everything ready to launch. Obviously, orders are still coming in the back end. We're still we're still trying to prep for body power. We're still going to body power and we're, we're setting up the stand, stand. And orders are coming in the back end. But this is where we really needed Craig, Dan, Joe, and Ben's dad, Steve. And we also had like some of our girlfriends helping and, 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 and people um, were helping. Um, it came around fast. We would be there like filling up the stand at night time um, whilst Joe and, and Ben's dad were sending out orders in the day. Um, Dan and Craig were actually had actually had uni exams around the same time as Body Power and they never even ended up going. So they pretty much quit uni to join Gymshark. So, still I mean... Playing, still paying that student don't, that loan at the moment. <laughs> Honestly, it, 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 it was... The amount, of, the amount of help we received around this Body Power, we probably wouldn't be where we are now because we couldn't really have done it alone because we, were, we weren't even paying them at the time. They were just doing it for, for sheer help of... of the company. So they took a massive gamble in, in risking their whole life on Gymshark and they didn't even know how far it was going to go. They just all took a, took a risk on me and Ben. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll never forget when we get there, we forgot the coat hangers. So we had to send someone back to get the coat hangers. We we're already really stressed. I think I was really ill at the time as well. And the first day is a little, I think it was first day is a little bit more of a trade day. So there's not, there's not, like consumers there, it's just people coming to, to meet. So, you know, athletes weren't there. And we were all setting up a stand on this day. Friday comes along, which is, you know, it's not really supposed to be a busy day. It only let a few few thousand um, actual actual consumers in. Anyway, music's blasting. We're thinking, we're still setting up a stand at this point. It's like two minutes to go. We're still setting up a stand. All I hear is, on the, on the, on the, on the speakerphone, the next day is opening. Absolutely ransacked within seconds. Zombie apocalypse. Zombie apocalypse. Stan got completely flattened. Everyone flew over, and that was it. I don't even think we really sold anything on that day because we couldn't. We we we, we didn't. We set the stand up wrong. We didn't have everything ready to be sold on that day, and there was too many people. So I think that day was pretty much right off. We couldn't even move. So obviously, after that day, we had to make a decision straight away. Okay, we can't sell like this tomorrow. We can't even get the stock out the back of the... Because we didn't really have a stock room. We were peeling off the side of the stand to get the stock out the back. So we kind of had to have a bit more of a think on how the hell we were going to sell. We needed more people. There was only like two or three people trying to sell. So then this is when on the Saturday, we decided, okay, this is when we're going to get some more people. We're going to get, you know, Ben's dad. We're going to get Joe. We're going to get some some of our girlfriends. We're going to get uh, Dan and Craig. and then. Even that wasn't enough to satisfy the demand that we had. So we we were getting random Gymshark fans. We were giving them a bum bag and we were literally just saying, Rotten, you'll do the job. And we just <laughs> stuck a bum bag on them and they were taking sales for us. Honestly, you can't roll what we were up to. <laughs> no, no CV or anything. No just... CV. Didn't know anything to do with their character. We just thought, okay, well, you're obviously a Gymshark fan. You, you must be a nice person because you're a Gymshark fan. Everyone is. And we just gave them a bum bag and they started... Taking sales for us, it was cra- it was crazy. It was. I think they were just just to be surrounded in that environment with like all the athletes and people seeing them in like, like I said, the looks track suit, this iconic Gymshark product. Um, you know, these Gymshark fans were just happy to be involved in any way, shape, or form. Like I said, if you ask someone now, come and work on their stand for free and handle their money and look after money, not a chance. No, why yeah. would that happen? You definitely, if you you could have easily over overfought a lot of stuff in this process that would have maybe stopped. You you making them decisions, but you needed you, you just kind of took it in your stride, didn't you? I think yeah. as well, like a lot of things wasn't thought about. Like I said, like you said, yeah. you mentioned that you forgot the coat hangers on the first day, but even things just like 
it's not just about getting a stand and getting the athletes to it. There's things like queue management, like that, well, that wasn't even thought of. <laughs> Replenishing like stock on the evening, you know, to body power. There's things like money. You, had, you yeah. know, we had issues with like five pound notes yeah. and stuff and prices. So you can go into that. Oh, no receipts, I imagine. No, no receipts. We had obviously roads re- from them. People were trying to scam us, like emailing customer service. Literally coming back to us saying, "I bought this at Body Power. It's 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 ripped. Send me out a new one or, or stuff like that." And like they were just people were trying to kind of scam off the back of it. Uh, it's just it was just a cr- whole entire well, crazy overall. Scene. Overall, it was a great success, but it was a huge stress. But from there, I think a couple of days later, I can't remember the exact date, we launched. Gymshark looks tracksuit to the public. There was only a couple available on the stand. We had new stringers available on the stand, and then we did a massive. We used this. We used Body Power as a as a hype for our new products, and then we launched them after. And I remember being in the cinema. We were only making, let's say, at the time, like a couple of grand a week, and then we we made sixty grand in like twenty minutes. And we Wait, while you was in the cinema, whilst we we're in, the I don't cinema. know what we did. That like we knew we can. Like, so I we don't knew know we had, we knew we had a launch, to. but we all went to the cinema to watch something. Oh yeah, I don't know what, and we just left. Then I, thought, I can't remember what we did. We left and we went back to, to back straight to the unit, or went back to Ben's, or went back to mine, and we just instantly started packaging. We couldn't believe the phones were going off. I think at the time it was probably only an, only an iPhone four. You can imagine what was going on, and it blew up. Let me set the scene as I want. We weren't just in the cinema. We was in the cinema, about four or five of us, laptops open. I remember we were quite near the front as well, so we. Were, Screens blaring in their face, people behind saying like, "Shut your, shut your laptop." <laughs> Honestly, and we were like, oh, "Look how much, look how much we're selling. Look how many people on the website. Look how many people that orders have come through." It was so we, yeah, we shut the laptops, lid <laughs> straight uh, straight back to because you had we had look, your little warehouse then at yeah. the time to package the orders. So off the back of what Dan just said there about the warehouse, um, what at what point did you decide that it wasn't a hobby anymore and it was an actual business and? And then what was your plans to then scale it up from there? So we were actually only in like a, a 300 square foot old shoddy next to a canal unit, right? And we knew obviously Gymshark's growing fast now. We're going to start to need to employ people and no one's going to come and work in the shed. Like in the winter, you're going to probably, if you stay in there with no heating, you're going to die. So we thought to ourselves, right, we now need to start scaling this. So we looked for a nice unit. This was probably one of the biggest steps because you're tied into a big contract. We'd never had contracts never really had debt or anything like that so this was quite a big step for us to start signing things we had to start to go to solicitors and obviously you know get contracts looked at and and start signing so this is where things started to get real for us and we realized this ain't really a hobby anymore we need to leave our jobs now because we're still doing our jobs so i think this is around the same point we left our jobs and um we signed the new lease for the new unit which was probably like a five-year lease with a three-year break clause i believe um, it was only something like two grand a month plus rates, which was, again, still a big thing for us. Um, so we got into this new, posh, nice unit. All of our stock, you can imagine it was a 2,000 square foot unit. We only had, you know, 150, 200 square foot worth of stock. So it's in the corner of the room at the time. Um, we got a table tennis uh, table just set up in there. We're thinking, if we ever outgrow this, we've completely made it. Anyway, three weeks later, stock flies in, half full already. Two months after that, Units rammed. We're thinking, like, we are really onto something here. We decided, okay, we're going to need to get the next unit. So we started applying for the next unit, which was next door. Same thing again. Luckily, we had three units next to each other, nice big units that no one had, and we could slowly start to get in them. So I think we signed another um, lease. So we had two big units now. We knocked through so we could go between them. And um, at, at, in and around this same time is, is where we started uh, MDV, which is another brand we have. Um, and we put that into one of the units as well. So we weren't just running Gymshark then. We also started another clothing company. So we we were kind of up to a lot of things, and in, in, in that same time, we only had gymshark.co.uk. We, we decided, okay, so actually we had gymshark.co.uk and gymshark.com. So in and around that time, we thought to ourselves, right, we need to start only having one website and just having gymshark.com. But we had to buy the gymshark.com domain for I think it was around £2,000 and I didn't really want to do that at that time but Ben taught me into it and he said like this is what we need to do and I said you're right yeah, this, that's what we need to do and we ended up buying it and at the same time as well someone we used to buy clothing off from you know two years previous had also registered our trademark and we really just didn't like him and he'd registered our trademark and we had to end up paying him money to give us our trade trademark back 
which is, again, another funny story. Which he, did something, he did something sneaky there. He did something sneaky. And, we, and anyway, Ben ended up talking me into getting that trademark off him because we needed to. But we both hated him. And we both made the decision then, like, okay, we're going to have to just pay this guy off. He's going to have to give us our trademark back. Mentioned as well, I, I want to touch about the table, tennis table in the unit at the beginning in the, in the warehouse. We, there was a funny story when I think we were just causing a lot of commotion because the, the warehouse is next to like, um, a housing estate. So we were thinking we'd like... We got a new motorbike, I think. Yeah, one of, someone had a new, I think Lewis had a new motorbike, but just packed, packed uh, past his... Um, CBT. CBT. So we're making a racket and we're all obviously moving in stock because we're all working like I was like, we'd work like eight or eight every day doing, or just hanging around at least. So I think the police came to see like what the noise and commotion was about. But there was also interest in like what we were doing because, you know, how old are you at the time? 18, 19? Yeah, 19, 20. Seeing, like, what, how's this, you know, how's this kid like looking after all this? And then I think like, they ended up having a, I think Ben, and, I think it was the Ben and the Policeman because Ben was really good at table tennis. Was... So Ben, had, Ben and the Policeman had a, uh, had a 1v1 on the table tennis table. I think if, if the Policeman won, he would get some free clothing. He walked away empty-handed. <laughs> he, walked, he walked away empty-handed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a funny story with the table tennis uh, table. That was good. Yeah. So everything's going smoothly now. You've, you've expanded into a few different uh, units. You're making lots of sales. You've got the next body power to, to look forward to. Obviously, it's quite manic at the, at the place. Is there anything um, that that kind of took you by surprise in that in that year, or anything that kind of threw a spanner in the works? Um, so obviously, as everyone knows now, Black Friday is a massive thing. But back then, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, it was still a very growing thing, and it was more American, and we didn't really know what it was. And I remember we were just getting around that time. It was like two two weeks before Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and I remember Ben came to me, and he was, he was just like, "We should do this. This a sale on this day." And I was like, what is it? And he was like, like Cyber Monday. And I was thinking, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, what's this? Because it was a new thing. Like, no one really knew. And we thought, okay, well, let's just gamble it. Let's just put 20% off. Bearing in mind, we never discounted ever. Like, so no one ever really received a discount. There was only ever 10% off, which was uh, just for athletes code. So the maximum you were going to get was 10% off, right? And then on this day, I think we did 20 to 30% off, right? We were not. It was like expos all over again, but online shopping. Oh my god, we were we were backlogged from orders. I think it broke our website. We were backlogged for orders for three, four weeks. We had no stock for the foreseeable, so we just didn't. We underestimated how good it was because we didn't really understand. So that was a massive span in the works because then we had to, you know, not only were we sending out orders, we also had a lot of customer service to, to emails to go through, and. Yeah, that's there's a little funny story there as well regarding the customer service because we'd all sit there at the end of the, every single day doing the customer service, right? And when there was a, when you could when you could see that someone had opened one, every now and then the same customer email would pop back up like it had been unopened, and I was thinking, you know, what's going on here? And then you'd click on it and you'd see it would be like a return, and you had to walk into the warehouse to do the return. <laughs> so we were all sat there doing the easier emails, just replying to someone. So no one had to get off their chairs and it would come to the end of the day and there'd be like 20 emails and everyone was just sat there. Everyone was like looking around, looking at everyone because no one would do the email. This is mad as well. So obviously, I didn't know what Black Friday was until Ben and Lewis told us and the sales was going on. But as Lewis said, it was manic because not only was backloading orders, no stock. Like you got to remember, Lewis and Ben were still doing things like website, you know, you know, syncing around the website, ordering new stock, designing new products, like planning like the next body power and getting new athletes, running social media. This was, majority was all Ben and Lewis, like people like me and Craig and Joe and, and Steve, we were helping with orders, returns and customer service, like, you know, the nitty gritty stuff. But Lewis and Ben were still doing all these other things, which people forget at the same time, as well as, like I said, having a second clothing brand as well. We, so they've literally got about 50 things to think about every single day. So I, I was a Gymshark fan early doors and I had like a, Gymshark clothing. And I noticed the change of the logo. So, what was the thinking behind the change of the logo? Why, why did that happen? Right there. What was the <laughs> first Gymshark product you bought then? Um, to prove you're a real fan. And I'm not sure the name of it, but it was a is a stringy with a tensing bodyboarder, like a round logo, and then Gymshark. Gym oh, and Gym then Gymshark Fitness. It's probably Stringer. Fitness. Yeah, yeah all the time. that was the yeah. one. And yeah. then I had a uh, a grey T-shirt with blue Gymshark, but it had that logo at the end of it. It had the words. Okay, the so yeah, that was one of the t-shirts we sold exclusively at the expos. Yeah. So yeah, I did actually. But I bought it from the expo. Yeah, yeah. So so we used that as a marketing tool to get people to to the expos. This was a t-shirt that was given out sometimes free if you were lucky off some of the athletes, and it was also for sale, but only at that 
expo. So if you had it, you, you everyone knew that you'd been to there and you'd met people in person, which was great. But we, going back to the logos, we identified very, in and around 2015, which is when we, draw, we launched the Fit Track suit, that we knew we needed to change our tents in bodybuilding shark to a more commercial mainstream logo. And it was a hard concept to get your head around because obviously you've just spent three years building up a brand with a Tencent Shark logo that everyone knows. So it was nothing like it in the world. And then you're now going to change it to a small logo like this that's very sleek, small, not loud at all. People are probably thinking, what the hell are you doing? But for the mainstream people, they're not like you, you ladies and, and the older generation aren't going to buy a Tencent logo. So we thought to ourselves, okay, well, how can we compete with the likes of, uh, of of Nike Adidas in the future? So we ended up changing our logo to this sleek shark logo, which was, luckily, we, we went to the same guy that uh, built our logo in the first place. We told him exactly what we wanted. The first thing he came back with was this. We, we said back to him, mm, not sure, let's change it a little bit. But then he changed it, and it just wasn't the same. So we ended up going with the first logo, actually, he sent back to us, which was crazy. And we knew we could fit this into into smaller places. We could fit it in the future onto different parts of clothing, you know, maybe shoes, maybe headphones. I don't know. We were just planning for the future early doors. So, yeah, we actually ended up running two logos for a while until we got everyone used to the new logo and then we transitioned fully into the Fit logo. Mm. Even now to this day, though, you see Gymshop bringing back the old collection. Yeah. For the, uh, I guess, for the, for the hardcore original Gymshop bands. There is still some collection of the legacy. I think they're called the legacy mm. now, isn't it? It's called that. Yeah. So you've you've swapped the website over to dot com. You've changed the logo. You've got your trademarks. So a lot of things all coming together now. Um. So you was getting ready for the next load of like body power and all that kind of stuff. What what was um the products like at this point? Yeah. So we're we're around 2015 here, and every single year we wanted to be bigger and better than the year before. So. Gym Shark 2013 was just body power, right? 2014 was Gym Shark body power in the UK, and then I think it was just the Fibo. Fibo yeah. it was just Fibo. Uh, so we had one, one 2013, two 2014, 2015. We decided to do the Gym Shark World Tour, and for the Gym Shark World Tour, we were going to go to LA, Ohio, Australia, um, Fibo, Germany, and. Uh, body power and these were all big expos all from around the world so we knew we could kind of you know spread Gymshark brand to different places in the world um, very easily just with these expos and again back to what I said originally those athletes are probably not going to go to those parts of the world unless we take them there so it was a good thing for all parties um, obviously in that time we knew that we needed to create a new product um, just launch to people every single year, and and this was the, this year was the launch of the fit track suit. The fit track suit was different to our looks track suit. It was more, it was it was all black from here downwards, and then it was grey on the top. It was a new, stretchy, more fitted material, really thin. And these were our Gymshark fit bottoms, which were probably our best with the new logo as well. With the new logo, which were probably our best selling product for for years to come. Now we had them in black, blue, grey. Um, we just kept launching. Wicked colours. So we had like grey and red, grey and blue, blue and black. Um, what other colours did we have? The main three. There might have been one but more. There might have been another colour, but um, and we had it so people could mix and match and change things up. And that created a new opportunity for people to buy and to buy different things. And it would hit a different market because the look track suit was very wintry based and it was very fitted, even though people didn't just wear it in the winter. This new fit track suit would would take us to to a new level. So we started making new products. We started making seamless. We started doing everything with this new logo, and we slowly transitioned purely into this new logo, ready for the world tour. So with the world tour, did you have to get like more athletes with bigger followers? Is that was that always the goal to try and get literally more athletes into the Gymshark family, or the and then yeah. and then with bigger followings or. That was the plan. Literally try and get bigger following, trying to get our, our main athletes to grow. We never wanted to release anyone. We wanted to create like a gym shot family. Once you were in this bubble, you would grow within this bubble and we would take you as far as you needed to go. So we tried not to get rid of anyone that we we could because that's how it wanted to be. So we kept adding to our bubble. We got like Furious Pete. We got Nikki Blackheader, uh, Guzman. Steve uh, Cook. Vince. Steve Cook. Vince Garcia. Vince. And the Hodge twins. Hodge, Hodge twins. twins. Yeah, we got the Hodge <laughs> twins. So we were adding to our bubble. Um, obviously, some of those guys, you know, didn't work again with us just because 
uh, they liked working on like a, like a non-exclusive uh, basis. And some guys felt the whole family feel and carried on with it. We had Mark Fit as well, Calf. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, everyone everyone kind of stayed with us, and it was it was it was amazing. Paige Hathaway, just keep, yeah, names Martin. just keep coming back to Bradley us. Martin. Bradley Martin. Yeah, that's remember Sophia, us. like the girl in Germany. She was huge. She came like a camera yeah. So 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 at different expos, we had different athletes because obviously some guys were closer to Germany. Some guys just couldn't do it at the time of the year and stuff like that. Different commitment. So we had different athletes. We'd take to different expos. Again, took a lot of planning. There was only a team of maybe you know five six people doing this type of stuff, and the same people were flying around the world that were doing to everything. So the same people would fly around the world, and obviously not being in the UK, we had to tie a lot of strings together that we'd never done before. So we're in LA and we're trying to tie everything together, move athletes around and do the expo at the same time and entertain people. It was an impossible thing that we somehow pulled off. I just don't know how we were doing it. I like, think that was one of the hardest things Jim Shire did. Like at this point we realised like what made the business grow. Like it was don't get me wrong, it was like right time, right place for Jim Shire to be born. But Lewis and Ben recognised that influencer marketing, fitted clothing and the expos were like the three amplifiers of of the bit. That, 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 that's that, that's what Jim Shark's based off those three things. So for them to like gamble and go from just body power one year to then body power and FIBO, which is a whole separate conversation of all, all its you know problems and issues that arise of going to a different country, to then going from zero to a hundred to going to like six seven expos to Australia, LA, like like Lewis said, there's things you, that you can't even fathom. You have to think about like. Like I said, flights, hotels, like who, who, Lewis and Ben had to do all this stuff at this time. So obviously the, the, this world tour, like was there anything that stood out that is kind of good memories for you? Um, all these, things like uh-huh. a blur. <laughs> <laughs> that year went really fast. Every, everything at every single place was fun. Like, it wasn't work. We were making money. We were making friends. We were meeting people and we were having fun. I've probably never laughed in one year. So I've never been so tired, right? So stressed, but I've never laughed so much at the same time in all my life. Like, everything was funny. It didn't matter what we did. Like we would go to expos, right? I'm, I'll never forget this. We, we would go to, we'd go to like I think it was like at, at, at the LA Fit Expo, and it was a massive hall, and there was there was like gymnastics and wrestling and stuff. And we'd go over to the wrestling rings, and we'd we'd be wrestling in them, and we'd go <laughs> and we'd get ourselves yeah, and we'd, we bearing in mind we're running a multi million pound company here with loads of athletes. And we were like all still kids. We were jumping off rings and, and all sorts and just jumping onto mats and pretending to be wrestlers and DDTing ourselves and everything. It was just completely crazy. Didn't you like um, book the wrong hall as well where you stand at one of one of the expos? That was expos. a FIBO, wasn't it? That was a FIBO. So FIBO was a, a, German, a German expo, right? And uh, we'd never been there before. We didn't even go over to visit it to see if it was even busy. It makes or, body power look tiny as well, by the way. Well, 250,000 people, I think it has a foot traffic... Of and b- bearing in mind, body power is you know twenty five thousand people. It was at the time, and because we'd never been there before, and we booked it so late, we ended up booking the wrong hall, so the less busy hall. So obviously, there was probably lot, there was barely anyone in there. But obviously, Jim Shark Paul was pulling people in. Um, but that was kind of an error on our behalf because we'd never been in there, been there before. We just kind of chucked ourselves into it. And I mean, you, you tell everyone what happened with all the well, gear. All the <laughs> oh man, manic. So like after the first body power, they they tried to design the stand better going forward. So this time we had like pricing on the wall. So they could, yeah, you know, I remember that. First, we had to remember how much everything was. So there was price on the wall they could choose it from. And we thought, oh, let's have the coat hangers in the stand. They can sh- like, almost like a shopping experience. When, it, when the stand opened and about 400 people flooded the stand straight away, you'd look over them all and all the stock's gone. But only, we only <laughs> sold about three things at the moment. Uh, they must have thought it was for free or something. So that all just got like taken, robbed straight away. But yeah, just little things like that. It's just, they're funny when you look back at it. But like, really, it's something that like, you just you can't think and plan for it until it's happened to you. Like, you know what I mean? Well, it was the way they operated. So in, obviously in England, stuff isn't free. Whereas obviously in those countries, if stuff's out, it, it's deemed as like, you know, this you can probably have this. And we'd never understand the different geography and, and how things worked in different countries. So people were just like, oh, that, that must be just free. We'll take that. I remember the one year when you had the, the athletes on the top of the stand throwing T-shirts out. Yeah, 15, I think that was. was yeah, it? same so time. So you gave... We'll talk. So we, 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 sorry, yeah, we made our stand even bigger and we had two two floors and you could have a microphone. We had the Hodge Twins on. Uh, what, what, what was their signs? What was the Hodge Twins signs? They'd do their live shows on top and throw loads of yeah, T-shirts off. I was off. like, who's ready for some free like, T-shirts? Fuck off me. He was saying all <laughs> yeah, sorts yeah. of stuff. 
do what the fuck do you want to do? And they're just screaming it. The whole expo was in uproar. Yeah, Honestly. There's just hundreds mad. of t-shirts getting thrown out yeah. there. Wasn't How many t-shirts did you buy? For, I for think that, we bought 100,000 100, t-shirts to give out and we could sell them on Black Fridays and stuff. It was a pretty standard, simple t-shirt that we had. So you could sell it year round. But It was a good business thing that you did because when you went to the expos back in the day, you got like a free sample of supplements and the free t-shirt. Yeah, like it, was pre-work, it, pre-work was, yeah, it was pre-work. Pre-work. Yeah, it was naff. So... But Lewis and Ben came up with saying, like, you know, why give them like a nap? Let's if we're going to give out these many T-shirts, let's make them look really good, feel really yeah, good. If you're a clothing company, yeah, you need fit to really good. So then people were like, oh, this is nice. So they end up buying like two hundred thousand T-shirts, throwing them out by the box load. I mean, we did all the all what seven eight expos, still had like forty thousand yeah, yeah. there, and we were throwing them out. Like, so people to, fighting over. Yeah, them. people were, but to get so obviously getting the money back, like it's a crazy business decision when you look on paper. But obviously, like the, the what we were people were probably buying on from that was. It wasn't kind of quantifiable on paper, but obviously people would get this T-shirt and think, I really like this. They'd see it in the gym, and if 10 people saw it, then at least yeah, one person's going to buy it. it's just brand awareness, isn't it? Yeah. Big wet brand awareness. And if one person buys just from that, then you've made your money back for three, four, five T-shirts. So, like, it was really, it was I still it. see this T-shirt to the day, and like I said, if anyone's watching you in, in the gym, you can, it's, like a, it's a grey short sleeve T-shirt, like a tealy blue gym shark across it. With, I think it's got like the big mm. logo at the end of it. You see it everywhere. Yeah. I see it to this day. Tag tag me in all your old products. I want to I want to have a look like on, on on Instagram. Tag me in anything you've got. I'll have a look. Any old memories? The world, anything, the world any tour was just mayhem. Like you can imagine, like we go to LA, we have to do the stand, entertain, you know, the athletes. We, we usually try and book some as well, like an activity or something whilst we're there. And then before you know it, it's like right. Did you used to go pay. to gyms and stuff when you was there? Yeah. Oh god, god we go that in a sec. But we used to yeah from LA, <laughs> and it was like pat onto the flight. Now we're going straight to Ohio. But yeah, the gyms like. He'll Lewis. roll up with all the athletes and because these are tight anyway, they don't want to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> so like they're going to like the pure gyms or some like the equivalent of pure gyms in there. You can carry on what you're like doing. Like low, low budget, low budget gyms, and obviously, <laughs> it, just, it was hard for us just to get into these gyms. Some of them you couldn't get in, so we had to buy day passes, and the day pass was like thirty, thirty dollars, thirty pound, and we were just so tight that we'd only get there'd be like ten athletes, and we'd buy like three passes, right? So you know, do the math. There was three people in each. In each cubicle so it was one of them glass glass like flutes basically yeah. you'd have to get into it it'd open you'd all have to cram yourself in and it would open so we'd have three, three big body bodybuilders <laughs> like all their bags and their f- camera equipment into these little like fl- alien looking flutes completely crammed in and god forbid the door didn't open the other side and we would have been just so they could screwed. save 70 dollars just so we can save <laughs> multi-million pound business <laughs> yeah yeah correct but that was our mentality and yeah. it still is today like look after the look after the pennies and you'll save the pounds like we still are in that mindset today yeah so obviously that that was the world tour was pretty mayhem like did you did after the world tour did you realize that you needed some extra help like obviously employing staff or even help running the business yeah so two, this is towards the end of 2015 now obviously you've got black friday coming up we're, we're going into 2016 um we knew we needed we needed help and we needed major help and we used to speak to some guy in the gym called uh, paul richardson which is uh he's still a part of the business now and uh he was giving us some really good advice on obviously you know nice old head he was giving us some great advice on how to to take our business to the next step and he introduced us to um a big problem of ours was suppliers at the time and um he introduced us to some guys and we ended up not really getting on with these these guys but we ended up really getting on with one of the guys who was called steve hewitt who's again ceo of the company today and um we would speak to him and every time we spoke to him he would structure things really well for us and make us see you know things differently and it was it was it was amazing so we kind of had them on like an ad hoc basis and then we dis- we made the decision to kind of brief bring steve in house and have him like connect all our dots together that we weren't so good at and that really catapulted our business um, in- into the future um so we got these guys on board in 2015 i think steve um yeah steve on board and then paul came fully on board 2000 16 we got uk's fastest growing company that year um and things just propelled from there the year after that we ended up getting the gym shark mm, oh sorry we, in that time actually when they came on we moved office to a big office in redditch we split our warehouse and our office um this point we maybe had 30 uh, 30 staff in the office and, and 25 30 staff in, in the warehouse um then in 2017 we ended up getting a uh, Gymshark Lifting Club, right? 
after the office, new, sorry. After the new, so after the sorry, so we ended up getting the Gymshock office, and then we ended up ended up getting Gymshock lifting club the year after that. And we just kept going on to high heights. We went from a six a thirty staff to seventy staff to one hundred and fifty staff to three hundred staff, and the company just propelled itself from there, just from getting the right people involved in the company. So obviously, the the huge success that Jim Sharks had over that time. Why why at that point then did you decide that you wanted to take a back seat and not not have an involvement in the day to day running of Jim Shark? Uh, because obviously, once when the company if the company gets to a certain size and the things, it's hard to make everything move the way you want it to. And um, I just wanted to kind of focus a lot. I like to get, I like to start things from the ground up, and like to, I like, I like to be really, really involved. So like, I started di- divulging into property in the stock market, and I just really enjoyed it. And it just worked out for everyone that that's just the way it happened. Um, yeah. So. What's the plan for you now? Obviously, people watching this will know that you've you sold your shares in Gymshark. So, what's the plan for you now over the next three years? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I've sold my. I've, everyone's probably watched Ben's video. I've sold my shares in the Gymshark company for a, for a nice sum. Um, first things first. From that end, everyone's going to be thinking, ah, "Are you ecstatic?" I was like, we always knew we would do really well, but the, the most important thing for me was to was to to give money to my family to make sure that like. My sisters and my mom could like live free and never even worry about anything, buy them a house, you know, just really just take the biggest stress away from them that I could. And that's the most amazing feeling that you, that you can get from it. And I don't really want to rush into anything else right now. I just want to focus on the poddy, as I call it, the, the podcast, and just focus on interviewing people, speaking to people, just getting everyone else's life experience out there a lot more. And that is going to be my main focus for the foreseeable. Obviously, Things are going to come up with property and things are going to come up in regards to investment opportunities and obviously, you know, the stock market investment opportunities. So those things I'm going to be keeping a very keen eye on. And if opportunities present themselves, I will jump on them. So so <laughs> just to kind of um, wrap up this uh, podcast Q&A with yourself, if um, there was somebody listening to this or watching this that is just starting their journey, um, in business is there one bit of advice that you would give them to kind of to help them through well i'd say it's you know it's learn from everyone else's mistakes because from everyone's mistakes you can try and you know avoid those pitfalls and obviously the simple thing don't give up because you never know where it can take you we probably almost gave up on gymshark like three or four times throughout the whole process at the very start and if we did then we wouldn't be here today and everyone listening wouldn't be here today so never give up you know but at the same time don't be too deluded to, to the fact of you know if things aren't working and you're trying it out for a year, then you kind of need to stop, basically. Um, but you just don't know where things can take you. I think a benefit for you as well, and it doesn't have to be, it's not like a, a set in stone rule, but for you and Ben, like you enjoyed it. It's what you wanted to do. They wanted to make fitted clothing for themselves. Yeah. Don't get wrong, you can make a business based off pure, you know, profit and, you know, you look, you, you can see the return, but these didn't think to themselves, Gymshark's going to be a multi-million pound, yeah. well, billion, valued at a billion now. They did it as like a hobby. It was a, that was an afterthought, but I think as well, like Dan said, the most important thing is based on that is start while you're young. There's no better opportunity to start when you're young and you have don't really have any any commitments, any real overheads. You know, when you start to get, you need to move out and get a house, and then you need to start to have kids. Everything becomes a little bit harder. You, your focus is not on the task ahead. You've got other things to think about. If things go wrong, then you've got a big problem. You know, trying to prop your family up. You know, you could be homeless. So there's no better t- time to start than you know right now. So, yeah, um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, Stay tuned for the poddy. We're going to get some brilliant guests on, and this is going to be a regular thing from now on. This is a temporary setup that we're in. Uh, We're going to be moving into my new house, and then we'll probably end up getting an office. So Dan and Ryan will probably feature on it quite a lot more. And, yeah, just let us know below who you want us to get on the poddy. Thank you.